name's Tom Weatherston, and for nearly 40 years, I taught for the New Albany Floyd County School Corporation here in Indiana. And I directed the theater at New Albany High School and at a, for a time at uh, Floyd Central. And uh, I learned a lot when I was working with young folks in theater, both as performers and as an audience. And today I'd like to recall three episodes that I want to leave for anybody who might be interested, either as a teacher, director, or as a student. I'm at my home in New Albany, Indiana. And my son, Doug, is sitting next to me here. He's going to throw in a question or two, perhaps. And this is being recorded by his son, my grandson, Ben Weatherston. The first one has to do with a time when we were invited to go to Bloomington, Indiana to take part in, I guess you might say, a one-act play competition and or a, a scene from a play. And it was very easy for us to say, yes, we, we want to do this. This would be great because it was in the era of the classroom theater. And that's a whole other ball of wax here, but I'll try to encapsulate it very quickly. Uh, at that time, we had every day in our schedule a 35 minute activity period. Uh, the clubs would meet at that time, uh, business of the, the various classes. When we, each student went to a homeroom, business was taken care of there. Uh, so we were doing our classroom theater, which meant uh, we would perform a given show maybe six weeks or more uh, at the activity periods. For example, three English classes would come to see Act 1 of a given show on Tuesday, Act 2 on Wednesday, Act 3 maybe on Friday. And so by the end of the year, uh, every student in the school had an opportunity to come and see a quality show, uh, quality script, and quality performance, uh, not on merely a social entertainment level and without costing a penny to any of them. Uh, we were doing at the time Emlyn Williams play The Corn is Green. And so we took an act of The Corn is Green to Bloomington. And uh, it, we were in an empty theater. I, I don't know the size, but it was good size. And empty theaters are difficult to perform in. The acoustics are bad. There was no amplification. There were no mics of any kind. And the kids did the scene, and it worked perfectly, as I knew it would. And when we finished, the judge came almost bounding down the aisle and said, how did you do that? Uh, I, I was sitting in the back of the house. I, I heard every word. I understood exactly. And there were no mics there at all. And Jill Jacoby, who was playing a role in the show, she started to laugh and she said, well, in our theater, we always have the little old deaf lady in the back row. And uh, he said, I, I need more <laughs> about that. So we explained to him that when we had a children's theater program in the summer, we brought up the idea that the kids wanted to tell their story in such a way that the whole audience would hear and understand and then be in a position that they could appropriately respond. 
And we even made a little old deaf lady. We went to the wardrobe and we got a, a old pair of Long John underwear. We stuffed it all with newspaper. We had a wig block for a head and a wig on. I think we even put a cord out of one ear so she was hard of hearing. And we put her in the worst seat in the house. And so when we were doing our little scenes, our little shows, we'd always say, remember the little old deaf lady in the back row. And it, it grew, all of these kids knew this and they always played in that fashion. So I, I was, was ever so pleased and ever so proud of my kids when they did what they did with the corner screen. And I can testify to the truth of that story. I, I went through the whole New Albany High School theater program, and I was in my first show when I was, I don't know, three or something. I was carried on stage in my first show, I believe. And so I, I did it all my life. And all my life, I can remember, you always play for the little old deaf lady in the back row. Always told that. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's a laugh even until today. But you see, the end joke is that now I have become the little old deaf man in the back row. You see my hearing aid over here? Right. The second story has to do with uh, one of the early musicals we did, which was the Mary Martin version of Peter Pan, the musical. Uh, those were early days and the school did not have a string department in music. We had band directors, but no strings. So my partner, Bob Carter, who did vocal music, came up with the idea that we would have a pit chorus instead of an orchestra. So he arranged music that the orchestra would have played to in support of singers on the stage. And the pit chorus was the concert choir of New Albany High School. In the pit, we had a small grand piano which sat in the center. We didn't really have a pit. Uh, it was just the space between the front row and the edge of the stage, it was flat. And uh, over on house right, we had an organ, a good sized organ, pedals and two manuals, not a Hammond. And many times we had a student who was capable of playing a Broadway score on the organ. But for this show, we didn't have one. So Bob and I put our heads together and we found a teacher in the school system, Hannah Wolf, taught elementary music. And she was a musician herself and she played organ. And so she agreed to do this. We were rehearsing at this particular time, the first act of Peter Pan. And you may remember if you know the show, it takes place in the Darling's nursery and there's no chorus. We don't meet chorus until we get to Neverland and we get the Lost Boys and the Indians and the Pirates and Captain Hook and so on. And one night at rehearsal, Hannah brought her daughter, whose name was Cindy, and I don't think she was in school yet. She might have been about five years old. And Hannah took her and placed her next to herself, next to Hannah, and in between Hannah and the lip of the stage, they were touching. And uh, you remember Peter flies in and is discovered by Wendy. And uh, Wendy says, oh, tell me about Neverland. Uh, and all the people are the, the lost boys and the Indians and Captain Hook. 
And both Peter and Wendy sit down cross-legged on the apron. They were very close to where Hannah and Cindy were. And this child crawled up onto the stage and joined these two actors. She sat down on the floor, cross-legged, facing them, and my two actors did not break. They didn't stop. They didn't give me a look like, what are we supposed to do? They went ahead perfectly. I was standing in the back of the house watching. The stage manager came out from the wings and looked at me and shrugged his shoulders as if to say, what do you want me to do? Should I go out there and pick this child up and take her back to her mother or off stage? And I, I signaled, no, no, don't do anything. It was the highest compliment that we could have been paid. And I knew at that time that the show overall was going to be successful because you want the audience to join you, to be with you, to believe in the theatricality of what you are doing. And this had happened. And I, I will never forget it. It was beautiful. And I often used it as an example in my classes to, to, to put a reality. It wasn't just theory, theory. It was an instance where this worked in the most beautiful way possible. We talk about um, the audience should be drawn into the play, should be drawn in. And yet this is a perfect example. That, that's a metaphor, really. Yes. But sure. that was a perfect example. That was literal. That, that did literal happen. Was drawn <laughs> yes. into that play. In a way, it was funny. It. But in another way, it was not funny. It was beautiful. Oh, I heard you tell this story. Yes. When you were inducted into the Hall of Fame at yes. high school. Yes. And yes. I was trying to tell somebody else about it. And I couldn't get through the story. <laughs> I have to admit. Very good. Yeah. Very good. That's story number one. Number two. No, that's two. I'm sorry. Three, we're going to go do some fiction here. Uh, we're in southern Indiana. We don't get horrible winters very often with a lot of snow, but we often get very bad ice storms. Now, we're going to suppose that it's, let's say, a Friday night, and we have had a show in performance, and we have played Thursday night, had our opening night. It went well. They're all prepared. We played the show, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. But Friday night, we, we've come. Our call was an hour before curtain. That was the standard in those days. And we're all there. The actors are there. The technicians are all there. and an ice storm hits, severe, suddenly, the mayor and the chief of police call out, no transportation, do not go out of your house. This is terrible, very, very dangerous. The question then comes to us, okay, should we do the show without Anybody in our audience? No audience at all. Well, with that question still hanging loose, let's go over to another part of the high school where there's a gymnasium and they're getting ready to play a basketball game. The players are all there. The referees are there. Their support group technicians, they are all there. But 
there would be nobody in the bleachers. Would they go ahead and play their game or would they not? I would ask a class, you know, consider this, think, think about it. Uh, the theater and competitive athletics are alike in many ways in public education. You put kids before the public. Parents like to see their kids perform, but they are different. The answer that I would teach is that no, we wouldn't do the play because theater is a form of communication and communication implies two. We have the actors on the stage, one, and we have an audience that's two. We tell our story, they react to our story with their attention, with their laughter or with their quietness uh, or applause. But over in the gym, their purpose is not communication. They are to compete with one another, one to get a higher score than the other, one to win and one not to win. And they could do that and it would be an official game and there would be no difficulty except they didn't make any money that night because they had no audience. Now there's a postscript that goes with, when I first started with this story, they were both fictitious, but I don't know, about three years ago, four years ago, Baltimore, Maryland was having very severe, troubling race riots in the summer. And their baseball team was scheduled to play a daytime game and all of the preparations were made and they were having martial law at this time in the city, but they were given permission to go ahead with the game, the, never unlocking a door to the arena. Uh, they played the game, one team won, one team didn't win, not one seat in the bleachers in the stands was filled. And so there are two different animals that you're dealing with. And uh, I think that's an important concept for people to understand uh, in public education. And with those three things, I. I think of them often if I'm asked to speak to a class these days, it's generally one of these that I dig out and, and give them some advice. I hope that uh, performers and teachers and directors will find some value in this. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Ben. Now we're going to have a pop quiz, a one word pop quiz. Take a moment to remember and think about the little old deaf lady in the back row and little Cindy at the rehearsal of Peter Pan and that unexpected ice storm and the performance of the show and the ball game. All right, here's the pop quiz. The answer is one word, fill in the blank. Everything that's done on or for the stage is done for the benefit of the blank. I'll repeat that. Everything that's done on or for the stage is done for the benefit of the blank. And the correct answer is for the benefit of the audience. The audience is the reason that everyone is there. The performers and everyone who supports the performers.